Uh, so right now our first speaker is Palmer Dubelt from Sci-5, and Palmer is the Senior Director of Software Engineering at Sci-5, and he is also the co-chair of the RISC-V Software Task Group and the, the RISC-V Maintainer of the Linux port. So without further ado, Palmer. Okay. Thanks. So like Celeste said, uh, I'm here to talk about software. I do a bunch of software stuff in RISC-V. I've been doing it for a few years now. Um, yeah, I kind of come around to give these talks. I always have a little bit of a history of RISC-V. Uh, so RISC-V started from Berkeley. Uh, Kirsten's research group needed an ISA. It was originally designed for education and research, right? teaching undergrad classes, and then doing graduate level computer architecture research where we were designing chips. Uh, we looked around for a while, tried to find some viable ISAs. You know, ARM and x86 were kind of the things that were big at that time, and they weren't usable uh, for either patent reasons or complexity reasons. Um, and so we decided to do a clean room implementation of our own ISA. Uh, it took four years. Uh, along the way, we built a bunch of chips, we wrote a bunch of software, and as a result, we found that we ended up with a pretty clean ISA because uh, we had a lot of time to develop it compared to what most people did. Um, and we weren't really planning on having a lot of users. It was originally just kind of an internal thing, uh, but people started asking us, you know, hey, why is the spec changing? Uh, I want to use your stuff. Why is the software not work? These sort of things. Um, and that kind of made us think, well, hey, maybe this is a bigger thing than just a Berkeley project. Um, so we decided to uh, spin off the RISC-V Foundation and Sci-5. Uh, so the RISC-V Foundation uh, it runs these events, it owns and shepherds the RISC-V ISA specifications, um, and then Sci-5 is a commercial entity that builds some chips. Uh, and then we released a chip, uh, it was our main driver for embedded software development, and it was called the Hi-5-1. Um, and then a few years later, uh, you know, we'd been doing some of our embedded cores, and then we came out with a Linux-capable core. Um, that was about a year and a half ago, and that really kicked off the software development around RISC-V. It was the first Linux-capable board. People started to pay a lot more attention when you have a high-complexity ASIC, uh, and things started to get really big at that point. Um, and that kind of bring, brings us to now, right, where we have a lot of software people, where there's 11 software talks at this workshop, which I think is probably more than there have been in any of the other workshops. Um, and as a result, now the software ecosystem is kind of too big to just kind of wrap the whole thing up in one talk. So a lot of what I'm going to do here is just go point to other people's talks, and kind of summarize them and whatnot, because uh, there are a lot of other things going on. Um, so we'll kind of just go through what is available for RISC-V, focusing sort of on what's new. Right? Uh, so uh, the, the kind of most RISC-V software really is a software implementation of RISC-V, and the big one right now is QMU. Uh, so we have pretty solid support uh, in upstream QMU uh, for RISC-V virtualized targets. Uh, and it runs both emulating RISC-V target, uh, and then also you can run it um, on, on RISC-V. Uh, so here we have a little demo from Alistair, who has a talk later today uh, about QMU, and he's running uh, a, a, a DOS inside QMU running on RISC-V uh, inside another QMU. Um, so it's all kind of nested and whatnot. Um, and so yeah, he has a talk uh, maybe in an hour or something. Um, uh, so uh, the most, I guess the, the big thing that people really want when they find the ISA, or a lot of the reason we find people wanting to use the RISC-V ISA is because we have the C compilers for it. Right? Uh, the thing we found early on in the development is that people were willing to do their own RTL, uh, particularly of the simple cores, um, and really what they wanted to get was a compiler, because maybe they had uh, another core that implemented a custom ISA or something like that. Um, and as a result, we spent a lot of time on the compiler. Uh, years ago, we had a version of it that worked fairly stably when we were at Berkeley, uh, and then we got the whole thing upstream over the course of about two years. And that's all in GCC land, been pretty solid. The embedded stuff has been upstream and reasonably stable since about 2017. Uh, the Linux stuff took a little bit longer to get glibc and whatnot, uh, but that's been upstream since uh, early 2018 uh, when we announced the Linux board. Um, LLVM is still experimental. That's uh, one of the big sticking points. Uh, but there's been a lot, a lot of progress made in the last six months. Uh, things are starting to come together. You can generate code for all the targets. Uh, it passes a lot of tests, that sort of thing. Uh, Jeremy will be giving a talk uh, specifically about uh, the various uh, open source compilers uh, after this one. Um, uh, and then another thing we found that was really important as we were commercializing the RISC-V ecosystem was debug and trace. Uh, so this is one of those things where uh, it's, it's a really big usability feature. Um, 
So when, particularly for embedded developers, uh, you, know, you, get, you get these embedded uh, boards, and really the only way to develop on them uh, is with an external JTAG debugger. Um, that sort of system has come up. Uh, we've had OpenOCD, which is uh, an open source debugger. Uh, that's been running for years now. And recently, the commercial tools have started to uh, work. Um, we have actually two talks about debuggers, one about bringing up the LLVM debugger, uh, which is towards the end of the day today, uh, which is uh, another uh, you know, user debugger. Right? Um, and then we have a talk uh, about hardware debug uh, uh, based on Swerve, uh, which is this afternoon. Um, like I was saying, the debug space is one of the spaces where there's a lot of interest in the commercial uh, you know, embedded software developers. Um, and we found that uh, people have been bringing up support for RISC-V uh, you know, Lauterbach, this was a really big one for us because that's uh, one of the big debug stacks uh, that came up a couple of years ago. Um, we have uh, IAR support now, it's uh, recently uh, announced, and uh, that's really good because they have a, a solid compiler and a good uh, IDE, right? And then the Seger guys have supported RISC-V as well uh, for a couple of years. Um, so that's kind of all coming together. It's really nice to see you know, the whole commercial software ecosystem uh, arise around Risk Five. It really means that you know, people are starting to take things seriously, um, and it's been really great. Um, one other thing in compiler land, uh, you know, we have the compiler largely functioning. Uh, now we're pushing a lot on performance, and unfortunately, uh, people still in the embedded market use Drystone and Cormark uh, for performance. So this was a quote from one of our uh, commit messages, maybe you know, two or three weeks ago in GCC land, where. Jim spent a bunch of time uh, doing a hard, uh, I guess we had a hardware optimization and the corresponding compiler optimization for conditional branches, uh, con sorry, conditional moves um, that we rolled together and that gave us 10% Cormark improvement, which was kind of a really big deal, right? Uh, despite Cormark being not a particularly good benchmark. Uh, and so we found that with RISC-V, people are starting to innovate in uh, embedded systems again and we found that we needed a new benchmark uh, so the talk after this one, uh, Dave will be announcing uh, mBench, uh, which is a new embedded benchmark suite designed for uh, modern uh, embedded systems. Um, so we're all really excited for that. Um, and for longest time, because we were in the better market, we were focused on you know, basically C and C++. Uh, and with the Linux boards and the large ecosystem starting to come out, uh, we recently started to get other languages up and running. So just maybe a week ago, we got Docker, uh, which uses Go. Uh, up and running on the dev board, the High Five Unleashed. Uh, and there is a single RISC-V Docker image on Docker Hub right now, uh, so you can actually run it, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, that's one of those things uh, that I thought would take a lot longer uh, than it did, um, so we're pretty happy about that. Uh, in Java land, we have the J extension working group that's starting to bring up uh, some work on Java ports. Uh, and then Rust has started to come up on RISC-V as well. Um, and Arun, who co-chairs the uh, software working group with me, uh, has a talk about Rust later today, uh, running on RISC-V. Uh, so that's the ISA stuff, which is largely the core and the compiler, right? and that's RISC-V. Uh, but there's a lot more in a system than just the core. Uh, so if you look at RISC-V ISA spec, it kind of covers this chunk of it, right? The core and a little bit of you know, memory stuff. Um, but that's really not enough to build out an entire system, and what ends up happening is that you end up with uh, some vendor-specific platform bouncing around it. So Sci-5 has our platform, every vendor has their own platform. And when you're writing code, a lot of the code you write, once you've been given a C compiler, is code that talks to the platform. That's all the operating system code, the bare metal runtimes, the RTOSs, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so one initiative we're spinning up right now is to build a RISC-V platform specification. This is aimed at Unix-class systems, and this allows you to have compatible software uh, between various vendors' implementations. I think this is really important uh, because one of the major benefits of RISC-V is a shared software ecosystem, and having just the ISA is not enough for that. So we have a working group going at the RISC-V Foundation right now. It's called the Unix Class Platform Specification Working Group, um, and everyone's welcome to join. Uh, we have a meeting tomorrow. Um, so uh, operating systems largely aimed at the platform. Uh, we have uh, many operating systems that have been ported to RISC-V systems, uh, various RISC-V platforms. Uh, at Sci-Fi, we have a bare metal portability library called Freedom Metal. Uh, you can use that to basically contains, it's a library full of drivers and some initialization code and that sort of stuff. It lets you write portable embedded software across all of Sci-Fi systems. Uh, we also have uh, some RTOSs up and running. Uh, we have Zephyr, which is a Linux Foundation RTOS. Uh, it's been up and running for maybe a year or two now. Uh, the port runs on the boards. Uh, it's pretty solid. Uh, and then we have a handful of Linux distributions up as well. Uh, Open Embedded, Debian, and Fedora have all been up 
they're all still experimental ports, so they're not official. Uh, but packages starting to come up. The main blocker there is getting solid LVM support and then the various other programming languages built on top of that. Um, uh, Mark has a talk uh, right after this one that will go into more detail about the state of the various operating systems. Um, and one particularly exciting thing is that the big chunk we've been missing in embedded land is a solid free RTOS port. Uh, so we've had free RTOS ports for RISC-V bouncing around, but there's been no kind of properly maintained upstream version of it. Um, uh, and Richard is now, uh, he's here giving a talk uh, later today, uh, and we're now putting together a uh, free RTOS port supported by Amazon AWS, um, and that should enable a lot more uh, development in uh, the future. Um, so uh, other important parts of the, the RISC-V software stack are so basically security mechanisms. Right? Um, so this is uh, basically every modern uh, system requires uh, some sort of security. Right, whether it's secure boot or a trusted firmware uh, or something like that. Um, and this is the part where RISC-V doesn't have a, a trusted platform specification. Uh, there is a working group uh, going to bring this up, the Trusted Execution Environment Working Group. Um, uh, we have some support in the ISA for that, but we'll need more. Uh, Cesare has a talk uh, later today uh, about uh, Hex-5's um, uh, trusted execution environment uh, that runs on RISC-V systems. Um, another large portion, of the, uh, large portion of the stack that has been not great shape, not in great shape for a while, are uh, bootloaders for Linux systems. Uh, so at Berkeley, we built uh, BBL when we were kind of doing this in educational land. Uh, it's a really simple bootloader. It was never really designed to turn into something used uh, the way it's used today. Um, but it is kind of the de facto bootloader, or has been for the last you know, five years or something. Um, but recently, the Western Digital guys have started to bring up. OpenSBI, uh, which is a bootloader that's designed to actually be a solid implementation, usable long-term, that sort of thing. Uh, that's starting to come together, uh, and it can load uh, U-boot payloads um, and kind of boot uh, working Linux systems. Uh, and uh, Anoop had a talk about that yesterday, uh, but I think there's videos for everyone um, in case people want to go look. Um, and so you know, on top of that, once you get the bootloader, you got to boot something, and Linux is kind of the de facto Unix system uh, today. Uh, the core architecture support got merged in early 2018. Uh, it took us a while to get the interrupt controller drivers and all that sort of stuff in, but we're at the state today where upstream boots on the High Five Unleashed, uh, boots on QMU, uh, it kind of works acceptably. Uh, some drivers are not there yet, but hopefully for the next merge window we'll have the vast majority of that in. Uh, we're also working on the device tree bindings, right, getting those all stable. Uh, that's another next merge window uh, time frame sort of thing. Uh, and really, we're at the point now where the Linux port is solid enough that you can start integrating your SOCs and your boards based on RISC-V stuff, because a lot of the machinery is there. Um, specific things that have been coming up, uh, BPF JIT came up uh, maybe six months ago. Uh, Jorn did that, um, and that gives us higher performance packet processing. Um, and then just uh, yesterday, uh, a no MMU port was posted to the list that runs on the Kendrite board. Um, and the RISC-V Linux community has been fairly active. We're up to 77 uh, unique contributors now uh, to Arch RISC-V. Uh, a year ago, we were at something like five. Um, so it's, it's good to see everyone uh, getting involved. Um, and then uh, as part of Mark's talk, he'll discuss uh, Linux distributions in the state of the kernel and that sort of stuff later. Um, additionally, uh, there's a lot of user space uh, programs required for Linux. Uh, we've had glibc for 64-bit upstream since early 2018. Uh, we don't have the 32-bit port upstream yet. Uh, there's some issues with 64-bit uh, time to support that we're waiting on the 32-bit port for. Uh, the hope is still to target it for the next uh, glibc release. Um, we'll see if that uh, we have time to get that done. Um, there's a handful of distributions bouncing around. Uh, Mark will discuss those more during his talk. Um, and there's one specific talk about cloud computing on RISC-V systems uh, as well uh, later today. Um, that's it. So the reason I give these talks is basically to get people familiar with the ecosystem so they can start contributing. So this is kind of the important slide. Um, so uh, a good place to learn about general RISC-V toolchain stuff is the blog. Uh, we wrote a, a, a series of kind of deep dives into the toolchain and how the systems boot uh, in Linux land uh, that are quite interesting. Uh, there's the software dev mailing list, which is a good place to get started if you just have general questions, kind of want to know what's going on. Uh, we also have an IRC channel, RISC-V, on Freenode. Um, and then a lot of projects have their own mailing lists. 
these days, the RISC-V software stuff is largely working well enough that most development is done upstream. So that means it's done you know, along with every other architecture. Uh, we have a couple of specific ones. We have one for Linux and QMU, uh, but most of the other work is just done, say, on the GCC mailing list, um, like normal. Um, and that is it. So I don't know if anyone has any questions. Thanks, Palmer. Does anybody have any questions? Question? Hi, I was wondering what about uh, things like real-time Linux. What'd you say? Real-time Linux on RISC-V. Um, so, so you mean like the like the RT Linux fork or the uh, no hertz stuff? Um, both of those. Yeah. So I don't know anyone who's been playing with the like proper RT Linux stuff. Uh, we do have, you know, like full dynamic, uh, you know. What is it? Full, full dynamic idle, no ticks, whatever it's called. Sorry, I, I haven't <laughs> slept very much. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that is going into the def config. There's a patch out for it on the mailing list. And everyone seems to think it works. I haven't personally tested it yet. But if everyone else thinks it's fine, it's probably going in. We can take another question. 